Okay, so we got the recording going here for 188. And I'm going to put on my student view. And we're, we're going to dive in just like I, I like to do for all my classes. I'm going to jump in the calendar and let's see what's what's coming up and see if we need to fix anything or all right. So uh, for this uh, for this class here, what you'll notice is that, hey, there's some stuff due this week, but it's it's basic stuff. A lot of the stuff you guys have already done. I want to say like 90 percent of you guys, most of you guys in the class have already done this discussion on getting to know you. OK, um, a lot of you guys did it weeks ago, so that's fine. If you haven't done the SB2 online safety test yet, uh, you, you should get that safety test done. Um, and the other thing is what um, what uh, diagnostics do you need? Now, I don't know why it says it hasn't been unlocked yet. So let's see what's going on there because all this stuff should be unlocked. Oh, that's not good. Hasn't been unlocked, hasn't been unlocked. Oh my goodness. Um, all right, let's see what we can we can do here. If I click it, does it let me go to it? Yeah, it does. So why does it say it hasn't been unlocked? Let's see, sometimes Canvas does weird stuff. Uh, for instance, this one, uh, what I want you guys to do is just say, "Hey, what, what, uh, what do you, what do you want to know about?" It's going to help me kind of um, direct this class so that you guys get the most from it. Like, if you got a check engine light on your car right now, let's use your car for a case study. Especially if you're also in the multimeter class, you can take what you're doing in here with what you're doing in there, put those two things together, get your car fixed. Uh, and I think you'll learn a lot more from the classes when you do it that way. So um, it looks like it's it's working there. Um, what I'm gonna do is like, if you have anything where you gotta answer questions, highlight this, copy it. So I just hit control C. Now I'm gonna click submit and I'm gonna go to text entry and I can hit control V and I can start typing in some information, right? So maybe I'm working on a uh, 1995 Mazda Yada or, you know, whatever. So um, that would technically be an OBD1 vehicle, but you get, you get the idea when you hit submit. Let's go to modules and make sure just makes me nervous why it said it, it wasn't unlocked yet. Now it looks it looks like everything's unlocked. Yeah. I don't know why it said that. Sometimes Canvas is a little bit odd. All right. So where where are we at here? We've basically have moved past the beginning week's information. And now I, I threw the Snap-on stuff in there for those of you who want to get started on some of your Snap-on certification, if you're interested in that. But now we're starting to get more towards our um, more advanced uh, stuff. And we're not going to get into these things tonight, but we are going to jump into some um, presentations on, uh, on scan data. Because a couple weeks ago, we spent a lot of time talking about trouble codes, right? Well, after you pull trouble codes from a computer, your next step is always, let me check out the scan data to figure out if that data supports the trouble codes. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, pick on CDX a little bit, and I'm gonna pick on a presentation that I put together uh, for you guys. Um, all right, so, all right, so here we are, we are in AA. I'm gonna go to this onboard diagnostic systems. 
I'm going to click that thing. I'm going to go down here to the media gallery. And we're going to look up a few of these different animations. Um, I think the first one we're going to do tonight is actually this one. Engine management testing, and it brings up a meter. Um, and this thing's pretty cool. I will turn it on and I can get it running and you can see stuff's moving there, right? Uh, what we have here is a basic engine management uh, system. So with this kind of graphic in mind, and I like how I can rev it up five that's supposed to be 5000 rpm i don't know that's kind of kind of silly but um i'll go ahead and turn it off what i like about this thing though is it kind of gets you looking at how everything's put together on the engine right so now what we're going to do is we're going to change our screen share to this and this, and we'll make sure the screen share is working right. There it goes. Shifted over some of the text, but we'll roll with it. So computer theory on onboard diagnostic systems. Um, all right, so remember this is all stuff we've talked about, right? Purpose of, of having computers control stuff is it helped us meet vehicle emissions, right? Fuel economy, uh, fuel economy standards and tailpipe emissions, really big things for us to meet. And I just couldn't do that with an old carburetor, right? That evolved from OBD1 of the 1980s to OBD2 midway through the 1990s. And of course we've talked about that for several weeks. Um, we also want a car that has good drivability. And I'll give you an example of this, right? Like these days we expect we jump in our car. It could be a cold morning. It could be a hot afternoon. If I turn the key and crank it over, bam, that thing should start up, right? An old car, I had to get in the car. I had to pump the accelerator, you know, three or four times maybe to set the choke just right. Or I might've had to pull a choke knob on my dash just so to try to get it started. And I had to adjust that and, you know, that's not acceptable for your modern uh, user of a vehicle, right? Didn't have good drivability. I, I kind of had to work with it. I had to really be in tune with that car. These days, people want to jump in their car, get in and go, and they want it to run clean, get good fuel economy. It requires computer controls for us to do that these days, right? So um, I got some notes of like, you, you never want to use a test light on something unless you're supposed to. Um, safety stuff. Anyways, um, engine control theory. Remember that every engine control system has inputs. We have the computer or processor, the brains of the system, and we have the outputs. And that's what we're going to pick on a little bit tonight as we're looking at scan data and looking at those inputs. So this image here, it actually, I took it off of the ASC test for the old um, L1, this is the composite vehicle. And it shows you like all the different inputs and outputs of a generic vehicle from an airflow meter to a distributor to um, here's our throttle position se sensor. Uh, outputs would be like, what am I doing with the ignition? When am I firing those spark plugs? Um, what about, uh, you know, controlling the, uh, the fuel pressure uh, or fuel pump um, by controlling the relay. So this is that ASC example vehicle. If you ever take the L1, the advanced uh, uh, engine performance ASC test, th they give you this diagram and you have to use that to figure, to answer the test questions. And it really, really gets you thinking. There's the oxygen sensor. I mean, th there's a lot of inputs and one thing that is really important as we think about inputs is there's the old saying, whereas if I have um, if I have garbage in, so here's my garbage can, 
if I have nothing but garbage going in, if I have bad information going in, I'm going to have garbage out, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Um, so a lot of times people want to blame the computer because the car is not running right. They're like, oh, it must be the computer's fault. It's computer controlled. Well, if it's not getting the right information on those sensors, it can't make the right decisions for the output devices, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so what are some various sensors? Well, your barometric pressure sensor, you may or may not have one of those. Coolant temp, intake air temp, throttle position, mass airflow, manifold absolute pressure, oxygen sensor. Those are major inputs that, you know, are pretty important information to the computer, okay? The other one that's not on here that's really important is I'm going to put, I'm going to write here, I'll do it in red because it's so important, engine speed. Number, very important. In fact, he's number one. He's the most important sensor because if the computer doesn't know that the engine's even turning, why would I turn on the fuel pump? Why would I turn on the fuel injectors? Why would I fire the spark plugs, right? So my most important sensor is usually gonna be my engine speed sensor, okay? What do you guys think the second most important sensor would be for the computer? What would be the second priority? Engine speed's number one. What do you think out of this list, okay? What do you think number two would be? Hmm, I stumped you. Air, smart air blow sensor. Exactly. Very, very good. Excellent job. Air. I'm going to just type in the word air over here. Air. Now, because if the computer knows how fast the engine is turning and it knows how much air is going into the engine, it can set up its base calculations of what to do with the fuel injectors and what to do with the spark plugs, okay? So speed and air. Now, the computer gets that airflow information from typically two sources. Uh, it's gonna either get it from the mass airflow, if it has one of those on, the, on that particular vehicle, or maybe it doesn't have a mass airflow, but it's got a manifold absolute pressure sensor that's another way for it to determine airflow. Um, so it might be this one or that one. Some vehicles might have both, okay? So you gotta kind of figure out, well, what's on this car, but airflow is gonna be the second most important thing. And then from there, we can start to back stuff up like throttle position, coolant temperature, um, and then there's certain times where other sensors have a bigger priority. For example, um, you know, when you first go to start your car, barrow and intake air temperature are pretty important on, a, on an initial start. Then they become less important because we have other sensors feeding us information, okay? But engine speed is number one, airflow is number two. And one of the tests I like to do, and you guys can do it on your cars, if, if you feel comfortable with setting codes on your car and using your scanner to clear out those codes, if you're cool with doing that, um, would be, you know, if your car's on, uh, start unplugging stuff. Unplug the throttle position sensor and see what happens. How does the car run with no throttle position sensor? What's the car do when I unplug the coolant temp sensor? What's the car do when I unplug the mass airflow sensor? And it's a great way for you to figure out, well, how is, you know, how's the car going to respond to that? And that way in the future, if, if one of those sensors were to fail on your car or maybe a customer's car or something, you, you kind of know what it's going to feel like. And, uh, you know, different, different, 
car lines, different manufacturers, uh, they respond differently. Um, for example, my experience has been that the domestic manufacturers, this would be, um, you know, like Chevy, Ford, Dodge, they do a much better job um, basically backing things up. They do a much better job compensating for stuff being unplugged than a lot of your import manufacturers do. Um, but stuff, uh, you know, everybody's getting a lot better. So, you know, if they see that all of a sudden it loses the, um, the th throttle position, let's say, it will say, okay, no big deal. I'll just, you know, pay attention to the airflow a little bit more and use that to determine how quickly I'm opening up the throttle. I'll, I'll do some backup type stuff, okay? Um, if, um, if we lost coolant temp, I'll just, I'll just say, you know what? The engine's been running for five, 10 minutes. It should be up to 180 degrees by, then, by now, and I'll just give it a fake value of 180 degrees, okay? So they have the, kind of the, as, as the cars got newer and newer, they have more backup strategies programmed into the computer. So if I lose an input, it can kind of, you know, fake it, if you will, fake it until you make it and keep that car running. Okay. So moving, moving right along. Then. Of course, outputs, the main things are your fuel injectors, right? But you have other stuff like some type of idle speed control. That could be an ISC motor or an IAC valve. Of course, our second one, second most important side, say like, as far as priorities, number one is the fuel injector. And number two would be like, what's going on with the spark plugs, right? What If I don't have either one of those going, hey, the car's not running, right? So, and then you have things like EVAP canisters, EGR solenoids, you know, other things like that. Obviously the fuel pump relay control is pretty darn important. Um, but these are the outputs. These are the things that the computer is in control of, right? But it can't control these things correctly if it doesn't have the right signals in on the inputs so it can make the right decisions, right? Back to garbage in, garbage out. So um, we got a bunch of names for this. PCM powertrain control module is our standard name that came with our OBD2 protocols, right? But you might see some documentation, especially on older vehicles where they call it an ECM or an ECA or an ECU. Uh, so if you're working on something that's pre-OBD2, remember they won't always use those OBD2 uh, acronyms, right? Um, and don't forget that these computers have internal programming. These days, a lot of times we'll have a drivability problem that gets fixed on a vehicle from a, from a reflash or a reprogram, not necessarily from a hardware thing. And so as cars have gotten newer, I always have to be suspect of, well, what's, what's going on with the program of this thing? Did somebody reprogram this? And that's why it's running uh, weird or something like that. I, I'll never forget the first car I had. I could not get it to pass smog. It kept failing for oxides and nitrogen. It, it was passing all the OBD2 monitors. Everything seemed great. It just, it's like it didn't get enough EGR flow um, or it had too much spark events and I was just beating my head against the hood. I couldn't figure it out. And then I finally got clued into, and at the time I had to get a factory scanner to, to figure this out, is that it had been reflashed and that was causing it to get too much spark advance, which made it have more performance, but it also made it have more oxides and nitrogen. Um, Anyways, so um, garbage in, garbage out, missing input information, actuators not responding to outputs. Um, a lot of times people want to blame the computer. We don't have typically in the field, we don't have like a box that we can plug computers into and see if the computers are good or, or if they're defective, right? So what do we do? We test all the inputs and we test all the outputs. And if all the inputs were A-OK -okay and all the outputs were A-OK, -okay, well, then the computer would have to be what's, what's wrong, right? But usually in the process of doing that, you'll find that you have sensors that aren't working right or output control devices that aren't working right. 
So I got a couple things here on computer memory. Um, remember that just like a, a your personal computer at home that would have RAM and ROM and all that stuff. Uh, we have this stuff, right? So we last week or a couple weeks ago, we were talking about our diagnostic trouble codes or DTCs. These are stored in the RAM. And that's why if you disconnect the battery for a long enough period of time, you can wipe out that RAM and you'll lose those codes, right? So what else is in there? Calculations, output commands. I'm gonna put on here, I'm gonna type a thing here that says fuel trim. This is how much compensation am I giving the fuel system based on my, my feedback from the oxygen sensor. So those types of things are stored in the, uh, in the, uh, in the RAM. Okay, we'll clear out those drawings and we'll keep going. So then we do have a couple different forms of, of RAM, right? The volatile RAM, it gets erased by removing the battery power. Um, there, as we get to newer computers, they have non-volatile RAM, which tend to um, keep, stay even if you do disconnect the battery. And these are the ones where the only way you can erase that code or whatever is with the scan tool. That would be an example of non-volatile RAM. So just, I wanted to point that out in case you're like, oh, I, I disconnect the battery, I can't get it to clear the codes. Sometimes you have to use your scan tool to clean the codes depending upon where they store it. Of course, the ROM memory is the operating system. So like this thing's hooked up to a V6, so I got to fire six cylinders and this is the firing order and that type of stuff that typically can't be changed without doing a complete reflash of the computer. That's your read only memory, okay? Um, and I guess really, if I can reflash the computer, it's gonna be part of my prom, my programmable read only memory. Um, my actual ROM would be stuff that even with the reflash, I couldn't change. So again, it's a six, it's, it's a computer for a six cylinder engine, not an eight cylinder engine, uh, that type of thing. So a lot of times with, with your, your, your prom, you can't give it a different firing order, but you can change the, you know, you, you could change maybe like when the canister, charcoal canister is gonna purge or something like that. So, so this would be kind of a diagram of how this is all laid out inside the computer. And then we'll relate this to what we're looking at here on uh, CDX. So we have our data going in, right, from our input sensors, and it goes in there. And of course, um, clock pulses, that's the in timer, in internal timer of the computer. And of course, it's going back and forth between its, its, its RAM and its ROM. And ultimately, based on what's programmed into it and what in information is coming in, it'll determine what to do with the, with the output devices, right? So again, if I have the wrong input information coming in, I'm gonna get bad information coming out. Do not stress that enough. And then that leads us to this typical diagram where we're, we're looking at some, some sensors and stuff now, right? Well, where are we going with this lecture tonight? We're going to scan data. Okay, or PIDs as we call them. Well, a lot of those PIDs are related to these sensors. So here we can see, you know, kind of how the sensors and stuff are hooked up. Here's our coolant sensor going into the um, uh, engine block or cylinder head. Here's our manifold absolute pressure sensors tapping into the intake manifold. Um, throttle position sensors connected to the throttle Intake air has to be in the in air filter housing or intake manifold somewhere. So let's switch this over and we are going to pick up another screen share. We're going to go back 
to CDX now. And here we can see that computer with the meter and stuff uh, hooked up. And, uh, you know, again, I can turn this thing on, I can turn it off, I can have it crank over. And at first it cranks over. And then after the computer sees information off of the crank sensor here, here's my crankshaft um, position sensor. Let's get that thing highlighted. I'll pick a different color. As it sees information coming off of this guy, it says, hey, you're, you're the engine spinning over. OK, I'll start turning on the fuel injectors and stuff, right? So, um, you know, we have all kinds of sensory input information. Here's a manifold absolute pressure sensor, intake air, throttle position, oxygen sensors before and after the catalytic converter. Um, and all these things go into the computer. So these are all potential data parameters for us to look at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close that out, get rid of those drawings. And now we're going to open up this scanner again. And we've looked at this scanner before because it's a pretty cool simulation here. Um, so I'll get that out of the way. I'll hook up my diagnostic connector and we'll get this thing communicating. Of course, he's gonna talk for all those different protocols. And after we pull codes, like I'll say that, hey, there's a fault code, check engine lights on. If that lights on, there's gotta be a code. I'll read the codes. And remember, like I told you a couple weeks ago, on an OBD2 vehicle, you don't want to just read the codes. What you want to do is read the codes, look at the freeze frame. So when was the code set? Because that's that shows you what your enable criteria is. Right? What are the conditions necessary for that code to be set? And I also want to look at pending codes. Pending codes are ones where it set the code, but it hasn't failed that test two times in a row to turn the pending code into a full-fledged fault code, right? And I want to write this stuff down. So what do I have here? Well, I have uh, a P170 and a P0, P0171, system two lean bank one fuel trim malfunction bank one. So it's running too lean. Okay, now I'm gonna go back over, um, now I'm gonna go back to this code, uh, the fault codes, misfire, number cylinder one. So, so I'll type this other guy out here. So I got a P0301, but I also had a P0171, which is lean on bank one. Now, if the engine's running too lean, means it's not getting enough fuel, could that cause a misfire? Sure it could, because I said in my last class, I said, hey, in, to run the engine needs heat, fuel, and air, right? Well, there's getting some fuel so it'll run, but you need the right amount of fuel for it to run well, right? And if I don't give it enough fuel, it's it's going to misfire. It's not going to it's not going to run well. Okay, it might kind of fire, but not not fire all the way, and that's going to slow down the crankshaft, and it's going to set a code. So these two codes, when I see them come up like this, where one is pending and the other one's set, I think, oh, you know what? I bet I'm running lean. And that lean run is related to the misfire. Or maybe I'm misfiring. And because I'm misfiring, it thinks I'm running lean. So these two things are related. How would I know this? Well, 
this is where it gets kind of beyond just reading the scanner. It gets into like, well, how does the car work? Okay. So, oops, I closed that one and I really shouldn't have. I'm going to open him back up. Um, I have these oxygen sensors here. And uh, what do they do? They, they measure oxygen or O2 in the exhaust. Well, whenever I have a misfire, that means I did not burn the air fuel mixture that was put into the engine. Now that could be, it didn't burn it because we didn't give it enough fuel or it could be I didn't burn it because the spark plug here failed. But again, if I didn't burn the air fuel mixture entering the engine, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna end up with some oxygen pumping out the exhaust, some air with O2 in it. And the O2 sensor is going to see that O2 and he's going to get freaked out. He's going to say, hey, man, you're running way too lean. So I can get that lean code, that 171. I could get it from the engine actually running too lean, like it's got a restrictive fuel filter or something or a weak fuel pump. Or I could get that lean code. Um based because the engine's misfiring because it's got a, a defective spark plug or spark plug wire. So that's, this is, you know, this is why you can't just go with what the computer tells you, but, but the way these codes stack up, if I move this, um, if I move it back to the scanner, these two things do kind of coincide together. Okay. So now how can I make the determination of what's going on? Well, to do that, what I really need to see is I need to look at the scan data. So let me go back. I'm going to clear out my drawings and I'm going to go read live data, which technically is in our first generic mode of OBD2. Now, this little animation doesn't have a whole lot of data for us to read here, but it's got the major players and one thing I, I'm going to type on the screen is that these data points, oftentimes they are called PIDs for parameter IDs or parameter identifications. So this PID is for engine RPM. That PID is for coolant temp. That PID is for short-term fuel trim. This PID is for intake advance, right? O2 sensors. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. Let's go back. So data is and PIDs means the same, same darn thing. Don't let that throw you, okay? So those were our PIDs. Now I'm gonna go back to the freeze frame. How was it running? Oh, it was relative uh, 65 degrees Celsius, so yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't super hot, but it wasn't super cold, right? Um, wasn't going too fast at only 27 kilometers an hour, but it was it was moving. Oh, but look at this. Short-term fuel trim, 35%. Long-term fuel trim, 7%. So that does kind of add up engine speed was 3000 rpm okay so some of the pids in the freeze frame are adding up now what i'm going to do is i can't control the temperature here but you know what i could do is i could drive the car so let's see uh foot on the brake Put it in drive, let off the brake, and I'm starting to go. And I was at like 3000 RPM, so I'll get it at 3000. I'm going faster than I was, but the idea is that I've tried to simulate. Those conditions, okay? So now here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go look at that data and see if it looks 
uh, similar. I got O2, I'm looking at my PIDs, I'm looking at my O2. Uh, Short-term field trim and long-term field trim look pretty good. So this, this makes me think, well, I, I got to explain to you, like what, what's the field trim deal here, okay? So to do that, I'm going to put it, draw, do my best to draw a chart here. I'm going to draw this chart right over here. And inside this chart here, we're going to have a couple of things. We're going to have speed, right? And relates to the, our two most important sensors of the engine. And on this way, we're going to put load. Right, so how fast is the engine turning? How much airflow is going into the engine will tell me how much load the engine is under. And from there, what happens is the programming of the computer will basically split this up into different cells with different speed and load settings. So my lines aren't real straight here, but you kind of get the idea. So let's say that this is 3000 RPM at 30% um, load. So I'm going to put 3000 at 30% load. And that puts me in do, 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 this cell right here. And at that cell, what's programmed in the computer? Well, what's programmed in the computer right there is, let's say 20 milliseconds of injector on time, okay? So it turns on the fuel injectors for 20 seconds, okay? What happens is, is that it either burns the fuel correctly or it doesn't or, you know, but the oxygen sensor, these O2 sensors over here, basically give you a report card. When you're in closed loop, the computer's looking at those oxygen sensors and it gives you a report card of how you did, right? So it gave it 20 milliseconds of on time. And if the O2 sensor said, hey man, you're still lean, I still I see a bunch of oxygen in the exhaust, you're lean. Well, the computer's gonna say, uh-oh, I need to, I need to add some fuel. I need to richen this up. I need to modify my programming. I'm gonna move this up and I'm gonna go up here and add some more fuel. I'm gonna go to now 25 um, uh, milliseconds of, um, of injector on time, okay? And so as he keeps adding fuel, what happens is is the, um, I'll go back to that freeze frame, is this percentage number keeps going up higher and higher and higher, okay? Uh, plus, oops, plus or minus 10% is considered to be the normal range. Okay, so you can see that we're plus 35%. It's having to add a, a ton more fuel, okay? Um, long-term fuel trim, he's adding quite a bit there. Now, what's the difference between short-term fuel trim and long-term fuel trim? My analogy for short-term and long-term fuel trim is kind of like uh, the parent-child relationship in, in the, you know, local you know, a uh, grocery store or Target or something like that where the kid's running all over and says, oh, I want this, I want that, I want this. And the parent kind of slowly follows them and is like, no, you can't have that. Yeah, I'll get you one of these. No, you can't have that. So long-term trends a lot slower and makes, you know, like the, the, the more permanent course adjustments. The short-term moves back and forth uh, at a much faster rate and, and it's like those immediate corrections, okay? So the long-term fuel trim is always going to follow the short-term fuel trim, okay? 
So if, if short-term fuel trim has been at you know positive numbers, 12%, 15%, and it stayed there for any length of time, then it's gonna start ticking up the long-term fuel trim, okay? So long-term follows the short-term fuel trim. Both of these are positive. So that tells me that the computer is definitely adding fuel. If it started with 20 milliseconds of fuel injector time, spraying fuel in the engine, at this point, it's probably up to 30 milliseconds of injector on time. So for whatever reason, it was adding a lot of fuel. Now, what we would have to determine is, is it adding a lot of fuel because it really is not getting enough fuel, right? And so that's why it's having to add the fuel and that's why it's misfiring. It's just not getting enough fuel into that engine, uh, into that cylinder, cylinder one, or is maybe like it's misfiring because it's got a bad, um, uh, it, it's got a bad uh, um, uh, spark plug or something. And then the spark plug, because it's not firing, it's not burning the fuel, it sees the oxygen. So it's kind of like, well, wh which way? And and to do that, it really takes more than, than just the scanner to figure that out, right? But what I would want to do is I'd want to look at this freeze frame. And then from there, I would want to see, well, how does that compare to the live data? And for this thing, what it doesn't do is it doesn't really add up because the live data is um, the live data, the fuel trim looks good and the O2 sensors are switching back and forth. And on the freeze frame, it wasn't, but I, I, was, I am at different loads and I am at different temperatures. So maybe it's something related to temperature. So it could be, it could be as simple as there's a vacuum leak in the engine. And so, you know, the thing to point out here is like the scanner is one more tool in your diagnostic toolbox but it doesn't tell you exactly what's wrong, right? Like you have to do more investigation. So maybe I got to go around with some carburetor cleaners spraying the intake manifold, trying to find uh, vacuum leaks and stuff in there. Maybe I got to do a, a power balance and figure out if I really do have a misfire in there and, and inspect, take the spark plugs out and inspect those spark plugs and, and follow that up, okay? Um, so, um, you know, the data, what you want is you want the data to support the code. And for here, the freeze frame data does support the codes that we have. Because I can see that, yeah, it does show that the, the car was running lean and it's trying to add fuel. Um, but the actual live data oops, the actual live data does not support the codes, which kind of drives you nuts, which is really probably a fault of the whoever programmed this little animation. So it doesn't, it doesn't quite add out, but you get the idea. So when we're looking at data, you can see that there's a lot of parameters. In fact, if I go back here and I go to not the OBD2 data, I go to like the, the, where I'm trying to simulate the manufacturer specific scan tool. Well, what I'll see now is I got all kinds of extra data that maybe I didn't have before, right? Like I have, here's my engine. Let's look at the data stream. And okay, well, I have a bunch of parameters there. I got uh, stuff for the automatic, oh, it's not programming the simulation, nice. Um, Anyways, you're likely to have a whole lot more data and it's hard to know um, what to look at, right? So let's let's go back. Let's go back to that engine. And it looks like it's given us some of the same stuff. And you know what? Um, although it gives us power steering, uh, you know, so you're likely to see data and be like, I, you know, I don't know what to select on here. In fact, to make this a little bit more uh, realistic, what I want to do is um, 
fire up our scan tool app. And punch it up there. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to switch. Uh, switch screens real quick. We're going to go the main computer screen. I'm going to minimize that. We'll minimize this. We'll try to get that document camera going again. And I'm going to punch up my demo. And we will not zoom in that much. Kind of angle this over so it's not. All right. So um, if I look at my all sensors data, what you'll see is you could have a whole bunch of data and it's hard to know like what, what do I look at here, all right? So the other thing when you have, when you're looking at all the data sensors is that basically the scan tool is talking to the computer and saying, okay, well, tell me what the coolant temperature is right now. Tell me what the long-term fuel trim is. Tell me what the engine RPM is. And so you can see it kind of scrolling through on my screen. Every time it scrolls through, it's updating a data parameter, right? It takes a certain amount of time to do that. And we call that time refresh rate. So especially if the vehicle's older, if I'm trying to look at all the data parameter PIDs that that computer can support, it can really bog the computer down. So there is a definite advantage by um, basically narrowing down our field of view, basically just selecting, just selecting what we want to look at. So let's say, oops, I don't want to search it. Let's say that I just wanted to look at the fuel trim, right? I can go in there and select just what I'm interested in seeing, and that will allow me to um, that will allow me to um, speed up the refresh rate. Um, we're going to go separate charts. So I can go through here, and I can select different things. See how it says it's not selected? I can go back to my data and I can select different PIDs that I want to look at and just look at those items. So maybe I want to look at the speed. Maybe I want to look at, um, it's giving me some weird ones. Maybe I want to look at fuel trim. Um, so I can, I can select just what I'm interested in seeing and then go back to my custom data list and just look at those items. All right. So let me switch this back to the, to the computer now. Oops. Yeah. And we will, um, Put our screen share going again. New share. Okay. All right. So what you want to do here is create a custom data list. And what that does is free up space for you. Okay. So I'm going to type over here. I'm going to say custom add a list and that's going to equal master data. So if I'm making a custom data list, well, what do I, what do I want to select? What well, comes down to like, what are the most important PIDs to look at? 
And this is going to be what I call the big six. Okay. The six most important things to look at. So obviously number one is going to be engine speed. And I'm going to put um, So this is the signal coming off your crankshaft position sensor. Maybe it's your crank and your cam, but I wanna know what the speed of the engine is, right? So like on my screen right now on this, on this data list here, I can't even see what the engine speed is. That, that's not, that's really, I'm kind of out, out in, the, in the weeds here. I always wanna know, hey, what's the speed of the engine? Okay, so that's, that's number one. My second one is going to be air, right? What's the airflow? Now, this could be the air from the mass airflow sensor. So I'm going to put MAF, mass air flow, or it could be from the MAP, which stands for manifold. Manifold pressure sensor, manifold absolute pressure sensor. So let's get that over there. So I can see I got a map sensor, right? I got a map sensor over here. Um, let me highlight that. So that would be something it tells me what the intake manifold pressure is. That's a relationship to, uh, to the air entering the engine. I have to get my typing tool going again here. All right, so I got my engine speed. I got my mass airflow. Okay, the next thing I like to look at is what's the coolant temperature of the engine, right? So here I can see I, I'm at 214 degrees. So that's good. So I have here throttle position slash load. How hard I'm stepping on the throttle gives me a good indication of how much load I'm putting the engine under. And what I should see is that the airflow and the throttle position, they should work together, right? In fact, I should see the engine speed follow what the throttle's doing and the airflow kind of, again, follow what the throttle's doing. Because as I step on the throttle, I bring in more air in the engine. Okay, so so now I'm I got four of my big six parameters, right? Well, finally, what I want to do is I kind of want to know, well, how are how are you doing, right? Like, um, if I know like this is what the throttle's doing, uh, this is what the uh, uh, coolant temperature is. This is the engine speed. I mean, those are the basic things to, to run the car. Remember earlier I was talking about unplugging stuff. With these sensors hooked up and providing input, the car should, should be able to run at this point, right? So now I kind of want to know how I'm doing, okay? And what is my primary method of feedback for the computer? It's the oxygen sensor. So I'm going to put O2 sensor. Okay. Now, this could be one sensor or it could be a couple of sensors. Um, I want the bank one sensor. So I'm going to put in parentheses, um, or not the bank one, but the, but the oxygen sensors before the cat. So the sensor, you know, uh, bank one, sensor one, bank two, sensor one. So I'm going to say sensor, um, sensors before... Cat. Okay. Because I want to know, am I running lean or am I running rich? At least what does the oxygen sensor think I'm doing, right? And then I'm going to look at fuel trim. Okay. Well, this is pretty basic, right? But you can see how 
your um, big six data can kind of stretch out and it's real easy for it to start um, including some, some other things in there. And so what I realized like back in the days of OBD1, my big six worked pretty good because I usually only had like one oxygen sensor and for fuel trim, uh, not a, most manufacturers didn't even tell you about fuel trim, but GM did and they called it integrator and block learn and you didn't have a lot of parameters there. Well, um, this kind of evolved. And so now I've, I've moved from the big six and I call it the great eight. And so what I do is I add to this thing is I, I add in both short term uh, and long term fuel trim. And if I have multiple banks, I do it for bank one and bank two. So a V8 engine is going to have bank one, it's going to have bank two, right? Both banks. Okay. And then the, the other stuff I like to look at because it does affect how things uh, uh, work on there is if I have um, a map and a math, I'll put them both up and then I'll also put up uh, intake air temp. So I, IAT. So now with all this mess of stuff, I have not an overwhelming amount of um, data pits to look at, but if I can grab map and math, again, these two guys should work together and they should also link in, they should follow the engine speed and the throttle position, right? And now I got some stuff that should work in unison. For instance, one of my checks is if the car has been sitting overnight for several hours or, or especially overnight, I'll go and I'll turn the key on engine off and I'll look at the data. And before the engine is started, the coolant temperature and intake air temperature, those two guys should match because this vehicle has sat long enough for the temperatures to stabilize between those two, okay? Fuel trim, long-term and short-term, I don't like to see that, you know, plus more than plus or minus 10%. And the O2 sensors, what do I wanna see with those things? Is I want them to be switching on the front O2 sensors. I want it to be switching like you see on that, on that screen right there. If it's pegged one way or the other, you'll see the, the fuel trim out of whack following it. So um, my tip for you guys tonight is to make a custom data list. Your tech tip is always don't get overwhelmed with all this data. Make yourself a custom data list the big six or the gray eight will get you going. It'll give you the most important things you need to look at that relate to how does the car run, okay? Engine speed, super important, right? It doesn't run without that. In fact, if you have a car that it cranks over, right? It's a no start. And we talked about this earlier if I have a no start, that's a no, that's a no crank. That's totally different than from a no start. Oops, no start, but cranks. Okay. All right. All right. Like that's, that's a different deal. So if I have a no start and it cranks, you know what I look at? I look on my scanner as I'll look to see, do I have RPM, do I have RPM as I crank over the engine? If my scanner shows RPM as I'm cranking over the engine, that tells me that my crankshaft position sensor is working, okay? But if I crank over the engine and I don't see engine speed on my scanner display, you know, it's a good chance, like nine out of 10, 90% chance that my crankshaft position sensor is not sending a signal to the computer the computer doesn't know the engine's turning, so why is it going to start the car, right? So that's an easy way to check to see if I'm getting any type of signal off my crankshaft position sensor, okay? So make yourself a custom data list so you don't get overwhelmed with all this data. It will increase your refresh rate, and that means you're going to get 
data on the screen that's operating faster, updating faster for you. And what do you want to look at? Engine speed, then how much air is going into the motor, throttle position, coolant temp. And I want to finish that up with the oxygen sensor and what's going on with the fuel trim. And because we can have multiple oxygen sensors on our cars and, and multiple banks, right? Bank one, bank two, the, the, the O2 sensors and the fuel trims can kind of blow this thing out. And so it becomes more than the big six and it kind of stretches out into the grade eight. And if you're going to add a couple more parameters, intake air temperature is another good one to look at to make sure that intake air temp matches um, what you see there. And in a lot of cars, um, that's related. Like the intake air temperature sensor will be part of the mass airflow sensor. So if one starts reading a skew, the other one will read a skew, right? So what would I love for you guys to do is Take your cars, take your scanners, start getting some data off your vehicles and try to make a custom data list. And then uh, when you get this custom data list going, hey, generate some fault codes like unplug stuff. See how does your car run with different circuits unplugged? Unplug the airflow sensor. How, how does it run? Unplug the throttle position sensor. And you, you know, on OBD2, you should see the data change and you should feel the car, you know, hiccup for a second and maybe run a little differently. Some cars are really, really smart and you can unplug all kinds of stuff. Like on a, you know, I, I remember doing this test once on a Buick and hell, I had unplugged all the sensors except for the crankshaft position sensor. And that thing had a check engine light on, but it actually ran really, really good uh, with all those things disconnected. Now, when I went to start the car, it really didn't want to start it. We, you could start it, but it was hard to start. Um, but once it was running, it actually didn't run too bad. So, I mean, it showed you the level of sophistication of the programming of that car and how much it could compensate for things. Um, so do the unplug it test, make your custom data lists, and in the process of doing those two things together, you're going to learn a lot. Let's throw this back to, I'm going to clear out all these scribbles here. Let's bring this back to our class. What do we need to do? Some things that I think a lot of you guys have largely already done. Your online safety test, if you haven't already done that, get that safety test done. Remember, I have a video on there on how to do it. Let me know if you have any problems. Um, a class discussion on getting to know you. And then uh, the biggest thing is what, uh, what diagnostics do you need, right? Because I want to put together some case studies for you guys on your vehicles. So if you can make these custom data lists and record some data off of your car, that would be fantastic. And we'll, we'll get into... Uh, the best way to take those recordings and, and that type of stuff is as time goes on. So um, I hopefully hopefully you got something out of this. We get to see a little bit of more how the computer works and how that relates to data. Um, and it adds on to what we're doing with our codes. So you always start with, hey, check engine lights on, pull codes. And then it's, does the data support, you know, pull codes, look at the freeze frame, write all that stuff down, then look at the data does the data support those codes? Does the data match what you saw in the freeze frame? Okay. Um, so no school next week. Enjoy your break. Uh, but, you know, if you got your car, you got your scan tool interface, record some data off of that thing. When we get back, we'll, we'll start putting those case studies together. And then we're going to get into some of this um, uh, some of this advanced stuff, such as if I go to the modules here, such as volumetric efficiency calculations, uh, you know, heated uh, oxygen sensor and air fuel ratio sensor testing, uh, and some of these things where we can see, we can figure out by looking at volumetric efficiency 
if our mass airflow sensor is reading correctly, um, maybe if we have a restricted exhaust system, um, we, we, we can learn a lot from that. And it's all based on OBD2 generic data, okay? So uh, until next time, hopefully I haven't bored you to tears. Um, with that, I will, I will see you guys later and you guys have a great spring break, okay? Goodbye, everybody. Bye, Tom. Take care, dude. Have a great week.